Anyway, thank you for rejoining us. This is our next fireside chat here on stage two at Procurement and Supply Chain Live 2023. And this one is uh, Navigating Uncertainty, a fireside chat on supply chain risk and resilience. And we welcome back uh, Michael Carson, partner and head of supply chain logistics advisory at, uh, at Cushman and Wakefield. Michael, thank you very much thank for joining you. us again. It's, uh, There's a lot to cover off, so yeah. we will crack into this. Cool. Um, I guess the, the first place we'll start is, is actually how you go about this. How do you properly assess supply chain risk and resilience? I guess there must be some kind of formal method to it. <laughs> You'd think, wouldn't you? You'd you would. Hope. But uh, <laughs> yeah, th th there isn't, uh, I suppose, you know, starting from the top, um, that there isn't a, a consistent measure of risk. You know, every supply chain has its own nuances, has its own uh, pitfalls, etc. Um, so there is no global measure of risk. Uh, so no one supply chain is more or less risky than, than another. Um, and, you know, I think it's, um, you know, with that in mind, you know, that there's no kind of silver bullet, I guess, to, to the answer to this. So, um, you know, shameless plug, as, a, as per previous, you know, we've various tools out there, but customer wait for we have our manufacturing risk index, which is a tool thousands of other tools out there that, that seek to put an index behind risk. Um, but I think there's a number of things to, to consider, and I think if we just take it back to basics and reality, um, risks, you know, there is a likelihood of a risk, and there's an impact of a risk. And I think, ultimately, we keep coming back to that, um, for me. And again, without stating the obvious, risks are only a challenge when they actually happen, become an issue. Um, and yeah, in, in preparation for this, I was just thinking back to um, a number of sessions that I've been to in the past and people I've had the privilege of, of listening to on this. And um, one in particular was really interesting was um, uh, Baroness Eliza Manningham Buller, who was the um, head of MI5 for five years. Um, and, you know, their mission at MI5 is, is to protect national security. So, you know, supply chains pale into insignificance in comparison. But you know, what she was talking about was you know was was managing uh, risk, um, and ultimately, you know, when you look at different scenarios, you look at the information that's available. Um, it never gives you certainty. There's always risks, you know, and part of her role was accepting that certain things were going to happen you know, and that you couldn't stop them. And it's the same in supply chain in, in, in risk. You know, there's, there is uh, an amount that we can do, um, you know, in, in terms of educating ourselves and, and looking for those risks, and we'll come on to some of them, I'm sure. Um, but really, it's about giving yourself choices. You know, how do I um, give myself choices? How do I um, know more today than I did yesterday? Um, you know, and also, what, what don't I know? And acknowledging that I don't know those things um, and seeking to, to learn them uh, or to find them out. And then, again, another topic I'm sure we'll come on to, but how do we, um, how do we simulate some of those things? How do we train for them? How do we um, run scenarios? Because when a business or, or an organisation is um, really considering how they look into their own vulnerabilities, that can be difficult because it can often be very difficult to review your own work, review your, your own organisation effectively. How would you recommend people actually approach that kind of challenge? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's, uh, I touch, touched on it a moment ago, the, um, you know, there are um, things that we know. Uh, there are known, known knowns, and there are unknown knowns, and then there are um, unknown unknowns. Yeah. Um, so I think having a, having a framework around these, and we often talk to clients around, a, um, I suppose, a pyramid of of, of risk or of how you can view the view the world. Um, so you know the reality is that a good proportion of things are known knowns. You know we we know, for example, we sit here in the UK. The UK is an island. That there is no getting away from that. Um, you know that's that's not likely to change anytime soon. So there are things we can lock in. We've got to be careful on those points that we've got to understand that, or we've got to um, be aware that. We could make assumptions around those things. You know, the, the world is how we see it, and not necessarily. Um, you know, we've got to sense check that, that the way we're seeing things and where we're seeing the world is is accurate um, or is reflective of, of reality. Um, and then there are things that are, um, you know, known unknowns, so or unknown knowns, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, that I think you know you've got to um, seek to enrich your understanding of, seek to uh, build a better better picture of. Um, you know, the, uh, there was a, a book I was reading, The Black Swan, for anybody who's into, uh, into to books on um, uh, sort of managing risk and things. Um, talking about scalable and unscalable events and actually putting into context things that actually have a limit and things that don't. And, you know, in theory, you know, within supply chains, you know, your demand could be, you could sell a 
a trillion units, a trillion widgets of something. It's unlikely, but you could. And what would that do to your supply chain if that were to happen? Um, so the things like that where it's about putting back to likelihood and impacts, it's about putting a scale against or a, um, you know, understanding the potential extent of consequences, but then you know, being realistic about where you, you, know, where you put that line of, of impact and, and likelihood, I guess. Another key theme that we've, we've already seen today, I'm sure, from uh, any sessions you've been in, is about the impact of such a rapidly changing world. It's something none of us can get away f with uh, from at the moment. But for you, what are the emerging risks and disruptions that organisations really need to be aware of in, in that kind of context? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, you know, we, we talked about it on the, the last session. There's a, a couple of things around um, kind of uh, nearshoring. So I think, you know, if I, if I break it down into, I guess, two, two key categories, I guess, there are um, operational things to be aware of. So I think uh, we talked about nearshoring previously. Um, I think there's the, um, yeah, the impact of um, things like, you know, changing and sourcing strategies. I think, you know, you've got to be aware of, uh, of those kind of things. Um, you know, the two by two strategy, which again, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, different ways of, uh, of counteracting risk within the, the supply chain. So giving yourself, again, choices, giving yourself options. Um, but I think, again, mentioned it um, briefly previously, I think things like technology, you know, understanding what simulation can do for us, um, you know, scenario modeling, spoke to a number of people today around different tools that they're using for that, how they're, how they're doing that. Um, and I think what we're starting to see as well within that is a number of, um, again, risk indices that are coming from that. So I think, you know, there are certain tools out there where you previously would be um, scenario modeling and balancing supply chain cost and service now comes with that underlying measure of risk. So yes, you know, cost is X, service is Y, but actually, you know, underneath that, we've got a um, a risk metric as well to to bring that kind of common denominator to say, well, look, yes, it's a, a cost effective, and yes, it delivers service, but actually, you've got key pinch points here that that potentially present a risk. Um, and then, yeah, you know, within technology, obviously, we've got things like AI, predictive analytics. Again, we've we've talked about previously the the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of that, I guess. Um, but I think, yeah, um, utilizing particularly machine learning, you know, AI, t to look at and gather as much information as those known, unknown knowns that I mentioned before, really, um, I guess, understanding or building as much information as we can, you know, um, and distilling that, augmenting that with our uh, view of the world at the minute. Because so I guess the big risk, the <laughs> risk, if you like, is almost over-preparing. You can almost yeah, try can, and yeah. counteract every yeah. possible eventuality. Yeah which can be very, very expensive. Um, How do you actually get that trade-off between being too cautious, trying to cover every eventuality, whilst also making it a realistic financial proposition? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And I think, you know, you can, you can par paralyze your, your business, paralyze yourself with, with analytics, you know, in, in risk and in other areas of, uh, of supply chain particularly. Um, and it is one of those particular, I mean, you know, there's never been a, a better time to be in supply chain in many senses, you know. For once, I don't have to uh, introduce myself and people not understand what supply chain is because of everything that's gone over the last two or three years. People understand, you know, at least at a superficial level, the you know, what a supply chain is. So I think, you know, we've got a... Um, well, I think the day everyone suddenly couldn't buy yeah. toilet roll, everyone exactly, became yeah, an expert quite, on quite the supply chain. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What's this whole supply chain thing? Um, so, yeah, I think, you know... It's again. It's uh, term we was previously balance. You know, I think you've got a. Yeah, we can we can analyze every scenario. So you know, my, my silly example earlier. You know, demand. We could sell a trillion units. You know, if everybody who has access to the internet, 5.19 million billion, sorry, people buy 100 and whatever it is, 90 odd units, then we'll have a demand of a trillion. It's not, it's not likely though. Um, so it's it's acknowledging what we know locking those in, sense checking them, it's acknowledging what we don't know and seeking the answers for those. And then it's, it's judgment as much as anything. Um, and some of that comes down to culture and willingness to take risk. Um, you know, we all have a willingness to take risk in our personal lives, business, business lives, etc. cetera. Um, but ultimately, yeah, you've, you've got to be, I guess you've got to be comfortable. And back to, um, you know, the former head of MI5, you've got to be comfortable that you've done what you can. And there is, you know, you've, you've, you've left no stone unturned on things that are 
either highly impactful or highly likely to happen within your supply chain. What interests me, though, is how is the best way of reaching those risk-based decisions when you're mm -hmm. having to make a judgment call, yeah. when you're having to use, whether it's human judgment, whether it's assisted mm. by technology, generally for you, what's the best way to approach that? Yeah, so for me, it, it, it comes down to um, a sensible use of technology. Um, I think, again, you know, the technology is moving at a pace that I certainly can't keep up with from a, an AI perspective. Um, but I think it's, for me, I always, always explain to, to clients the the power of having a digital twin, you know, or, or whatever term you use, but a, a representation that of your supply chain um, that you can play scenarios on. So you can then take those, you know, however sort of wide reaching you want to take, um, uh, take the scenarios, but what's the impact? You know, what, what, what would actually happen? Let's play that through. So let's look at demand over the last 12 months, 24 months. If it doubled or if you know that supplier um, wasn't in existence or that port closed, all those different scenarios. And then again, you can put another layer of, okay, so what's the likelihood of that? What's the impact, et cetera? So I think for me, it's ultimately does come down to making a decision as we all have to do. Um, but I think it's how do we use technology to give us that visibility? How do we, how do we get that um, overarching view of, of our supply chain to therefore see those pinch points make those decisions, um, or um, make informed decisions, should I say. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it, yeah, it comes down to that, uh, yeah, building that, building that visibility. Because how much of that is now human gut instinct? Because a, a lot of it used to be based yeah. a lot more on that. Does that still come into play? Is that experience and human experience still incredibly valuable? It, it absolutely, yeah. yeah. And again, it's that augmentation of technology and uh, human insight. Um, yet yeah, we can gather more information quicker, uh, more readily from you know from the internet, from you know different sources. Um, but ultimately, yeah, experience. You know, um, and actually, there's there's a whole heap of, of clients that that I speak to. Um, maybe not a majority, but certainly a, a good chunk that. Um, yeah, don't don't use simulation. Um, arguably, would would benefit from from that. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll go on kind of go instinct, um, and that's a wide range of, of scale of businesses. Um, but yeah, the, the you know ultimately there is a, a benefit for that. I remember a, a client that I was working with pre-pandemic. It was um, around the time of, of Brexit, um, and in essence, they they were looking for us or they worked with us to. Um, in essence, identify or to build a digital twin, a value stream map, as they called it, of their supply chain to assess certain sites within their network as to whether they should close one. There's one well, underperforming site. Um, ultimately, you know, their gut instinct was, okay, the logic tells us to close that site, but our gut instinct's telling us we think there's a bit of a there's a benefit there. And as it's now transpired, six seven years later, that site is a site they're looking to invest in and grow because it's provided a key linchpin within their network from both the Brexit perspective, um, but also the nearshoring argument, or, or conversation. Um, so yeah, it's th there's always a place for you know, experience and um, I suppose some gut instinct. Some gut instinct still exists. <laughs> um, one thing I did want to move into next is good examples. And, I, and I'd also like to put this to the room at some point as well, if anyone has had any great examples that they've seen. Uh, and I'll come to that in just a moment. So uh, do do have your thinking um, caps on <laughs> for a second. A few best examples you've seen of, of ideas to reduce risk in supply chains. And I guess sometimes it can be very simple things. Y yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll come back to the one I mentioned earlier, the, the, the two by two strategy. You know, it was, was one that kind of flowed across my desk. There's, there's lots of different approaches being deployed out there. And I'm sure people in the, in the audience will, will have some really good examples. But I thought that the two by two was a really neat example because I think not only is it a kind of pragmatic solution, um, but it's also relatable. It's something you know it stuck with stuck with me. Um, but maybe as a bit of a supply chain geek, that that's natural. Um, but I think when cascading that through the organisation, I think it's really important that people understand why we're doing things, and therefore having a simplicity to the idea as to you know what it is we're doing really has has a value to it. Um, you know, we can have the the best ideas, but you know for some reason they don't land because they don't that they maybe perceived to be too complicated or there and so you don't get an engagement and therefore it doesn't actually come to fruition so you know I'm working in procurement and I'm you know well, I'm working with this other supplier I don't really need you know it's well, we're fine with this one but actually having a simplicity to the message and a, 
I suppose a brand almost behind it. Um, I thought it was really neat. I thought that yeah. was a really good example. Um, That's a great idea. Um, well, I will throw to the room. If, there, if there's anyone particularly who's got an example they'd want to share, I'm very happy to hear it at this point. Um, I see no hands. <laughs> That's fine. I always like to give that opportunity because <laughs> sometimes you get half the room put their hand up and other times you don't. Um, what I wanted to move on to next, though, is um, how an effective supply chain risk management some strategy can really feed into a competitive advantage. Mm. Because sometimes it might, you might feel there's a bit of a gap between the two. One of them might yeah. feel quite defensive rather than yeah. sort of the other. Do you think there's a strong link between? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there's, I think what we've probably seen over the last two or three years is um, a, in many senses, it's, it's not proven a competitive advantage. It's actually just retained our business. Um, so keeping the supply in supply chain as I've occasionally used with uh, with clients. I think, you know, that it, I don't think it's optional anymore to not assess risk in our supply chains um, to some degree. Now, that's not necessarily over engineering it and creating huge, um, hugely complex models or things like, you know, it's, you know, square pegs for square holes. Um, but I think for me, in assessing risk, in giving yourself visibility, you naturally get a deeper understanding of your business. You build a, a richer picture of um, those known knowns and those unknown knowns, and therefore minimise the, um, I suppose, the true black swan events, the things that you really weren't expecting. Um, and in doing that, giving yourself options, um, you know, and I think you, from that you can then. I've seen, you know, options come to the fore that have previously been ruled out because they were they weren't cost effective. They didn't deliver the right service. But actually now we're reconsidering them because they provide something different. They provide an option for risk or to mitigate risk. Um and it also brings into to focus what if we do nothing? What happens if, you know, um if if you know, if we just sit, you know, stay as we are, what's the impact? So it, it gives a an imperative for change, which for me typically drives continuous improvement um within an organization. Again, however, small, medium or large that, that change may be, I think it's it's always healthy to have that, that constant flow of, of continuous improvement through the business. Okay, there is one more question I want to get to, but I will just open uh, to the room for any questions uh, when it comes to um, supply chain risk and resilience. Any particular questions from the room? And we do just in the centre there, please, Tracy. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hi. Uh, this is more about the people side of uh, risk and resilience. So if you were advising uh, an organization who are building a supply chain or procurement team from scratch, what would you say the skills and capabilities that you'd be looking for in a team to be ready for risk and resilience? Or put another way, if I'm a procurement person sat here today, I'm hearing all about the pace of change and where things are headed in this AI driven world. What should I be upskilling? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think for me, the underpinning, and there's lots of different facets, it's a really good question. I think the thing for me is the willingness to adapt. I think in, a, in an ever changing world, I think, you know, we've all experienced it, you know, our, our working habits, our, our lives have fundamentally changed. You know, some have, have kind of migrated back to normality or pre pandemic, shall we say. Um, but I think an overarching need within the workforce is a, um, an ability to change, to adapt. Um, you know, I think if you're looking to build a team, and not that it particularly exists anymore, but if you're looking for you know, a team of 10 people wanting to sit in a room and work nine till five, and then go home, you know, that, that isn't the world we work in anymore. It is for some people, admittedly, but it's you know, the, the, the pace of change. We don't, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know again, um, and we don't know what's gonna be you know, around the corner in, Ten years, who knows? You know, the AI bots may have taken over by then. Um, so I think you've got a, for me, a key skill is is that ability, ability to uh, and willingness to change and flex. Okay, um, that was actually going to be pretty much my last question. You phrased <laughs> it immeasurably better than yeah. me. We have another question over there. Thank you. Um, again, a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, You've brought up Taleb, and I agree with you, brilliant book, Black Swan Thinking, <laughs> um, everybody should read it. You've also talked about scenario planning. Now, obviously, Shell were the originators of scenario planning, um, and they um, suggest to organizations that they have a bank of scenarios yep. um, that they use routinely against um, problem space. Is that your experience? Could you just unpackage what you were talking about a little bit more in that area? Yeah, sure. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, you know, Michelle obviously being um, the, the leaders, uh, I think for a few businesses in reality have a bank of scenarios they test. Um, I think, you know, the um, in my experience, it's one of the key points when we're doing uh, supply chain assessments, whether that's optimization, whether that's managing risk, is to really understand, so what are some of the hypotheses within the, um, you know, within the client organization, you know, what, what do they think is a challenge, or what do they think is a risk, or what they, they think they're trying to achieve, um, or what do they think the answer is to what they're trying to achieve, and it's really then unpacking that with them and, and those nuances to say, okay, well, you know, fine, here's, here's two or three scenarios, but how do we, how do we uh, take the layers down on that, so what, you know, what if, you know, you have a, a network of 10 sites currently, well, what if it was five, what if it was 15? So it's, I guess, putting some tolerances around what might be either a bank or a, a initial hypothesis and saying, okay, well, let's just stretch that either way um, and see what the, the outcome is. And that's the beauty of scenario modeling. It, it gives you the opportunity to, um, yeah, to to run endless numbers of scenarios, I guess. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good good question. And uh, in the scenario of, or in the example of uh, a bank of scenarios, it's really key to, to make sure that you're sense checking those periodically. Um, again, given the pace of change, particularly. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Any further questions before we move on? I see no further hands. Okay, Michael, thank you very much no, indeed. Thank you. Really enjoyed your company. Round of applause for Michael, please. Thank you.